Nominees for best multiplayer game. Multiversus, Overwatch 2, Splatoon 3, and TMNT Shredder's Revenge. And the game award goes to Splatoon 3. Who? All right. As a standalone game, is Splatoon 3 the best Splatoon game? Yes. After one year of updates, has Splatoon 3 done enough to distinguish itself from Splatoon 2? No. So let's talk about it. But first, if you're a fan of fun multiplayer games, then you may want to check out today's sponsor, Rune. Rune is a completely free app that includes multiplayer minigames and voice chat, with an ever-growing collection of games, some of which developed by indie developers. One game that I legit really enjoyed and kept playing in my free time was Pinpoint. It's kind of like GeoGuessr where you try to guess the location, but instead of the images being sourced from Google Maps, they're really high-quality panoramas from indie photographers. You can see their names afterwards, and you get a really cool image to look at. Feels like I'm traveling the world on a budget. You can play it solo, you can invite friends for multiplayer, or get matched with new people on the app to play with. I tried playing Pinpoint against the doggy, but I can't beat him! He just keeps winning! Ah, ah, ah! You don't even have fingers! Ah, but the nose, nose! Rune is completely free for both Android and iOS. You can download it using the link in the description or pinned comment below, and thanks again to Rune for sponsoring Sponsoring today's video. Starting with the things Splatoon 3 does well, the core mechanics, the game feel, the sound design, the soundtrack, the personality, all the stuff that makes Splatoon Splatoon and not, you know, Crayola Scoot, it's back in full force and better than ever. The game has the sauce. Compared to the previous entry, Splatoon 3 is a sequel of a thousand tiny improvements. Some of my favorite ones are currently scrolling by. There are certainly enough enhancements to say, yes, this clearly could not have just been Splatoon 2 DLC, this makes sense as its own standalone release. Because Splatoon has always been extremely behind the times in terms of user experience, quality of life, and simple no-brainer features. For example, it took them three games and seven years just to be able to play with people without having to add every single one of them individually as a friend. And even then, it still took them six months to add that to this game! Remember how in Splatoon 1 you couldn't play Splatfest with friends? At all? Yes, it's Nintendo's first online shooter, but they also had over a decade of examples of no-brainer features from one of gaming's most consistent popular genres. Plus, Nintendo employs some of the most skilled game designers on the planet, and the company just has so, so much money. But I'm not saying they should have made it more like Call of Duty Shooter Man. But if I was making a game in a genre I'm not super familiar with, I wouldn't bury my head in the sand and try to reinvent the wheel. I'd do research on similar games to find out what they did right and wrong while still bringing in my own ideas. So with Splatoon 3, I was looking forward to lessons learned from Splatoon 2 and building up from the foundation that Splatoon 2 established five years ago, and finally getting a Splatoon game with a normal dev cycle. And while I do like these tiny improvements and small additions, I'm glad that they're all here. These are extra. When I'm evaluating the core of an online shooter, I'm looking at the online and the shooting. And the online fucking sucks. I don't know if it's just more noticeable now, but there's more lag and disconnects than ever before. Splatoon still has its pathetically low refresh rate. Combined with the peer-to-peer -peer connection and netcode that checks if Windows 98 is installed? Look, I'll admit, I do not know a ton about netcodes and stuff, but I feel like it's a little weird that the Nintendo Switch 2017 checks if Windows 1998 8 is installed? Like, what are we doing here? And you gotta pay anywhere from $20 to $80 per year just to play online. Well, in Splatoon 3, if someone disconnects early, the match ends early, which is fine, but why is the disconnect message on screen for so long? And if someone disconnects midway through a match, why doesn't the game compensate at all for that, like with a bot or a tenacity buff for remaining players? All it says is, oh, that match doesn't count as a loss, sorry. So, the shooting. Let's look at each season's content. Ever since Splatoon 1 was released earlier than expected because Star Fox Zero needed more time and still shit the bed, Splatoon has always been an ongoing game, where you pay full price up front for a small part of the game, and the rest of the game is gradually piecemealed out to you over time via free updates, and by free I mean included in the price of the game. Now me personally, and this may be a minority opinion, story of my life, I hate update cycles. While updates and additional content can be exciting, when I'm making a purchase, I'd prefer to know what I'm getting 
up front, not a husk and a promise for future stuff later, especially when they don't even tell you how much of the game you're even buying. But if you wait too long to buy, sometimes they start taking stuff away. And this is a relatively recent thing. It only exists because updates are free advertisements for the game after it's released. I do not like this software as a service model that games have adapted in the past 10 or so years. Not every game needs to be Fortnite or Team Fortress 2, but gamers' minds have been so warped to expect constant updates due to hype cycles or whatever. We're never going back to, you buy the game and that's the game. That's not the reality we live in anymore. Splatoon 1 had updates at random times, but usually at least once a week. Splatoon 2 started with updates every Friday, and then after about 9 months they switched to a monthly schedule. Splatoon 3 has seasons that last 3 months each, and the game takes big dumps of content at the beginning of each season. They said right before the game came out that they're doing 2 years worth of updates, so presumably 8 seasons. At time of writing, we are at the beginning of Season 5. Season 1, Drizzle Season. Splatoon 3 at launch reminded me of all the reasons I like Splatoon in the first place. Hero Mode, Return of the Mammalians, the only single player content. Already made a full length video about it, so we'll breeze through this. This time, it's more than just a tutorial, it's a fully fleshed out game mode. Of the series' three Hero Mode campaigns, this is absolutely the best one, and nobody who is normal will disagree with that statement. That being said, it doesn't score any points for originality, since many of its best ideas were cropped from Octo Expansion. The two new features it does introduce is a skill tree, like most modern games, and throwing Little Buddy as a sub-weapon. How and why you are friends with Little Buddy will not be explained. But overall, the story and the lore details are pretty cool, the gameplay was overall pretty fun, and I completed it the weekend Splatoon 3 came out and had not touched it or thought about it since. But be for real, nobody bought this game for the single player. The multiplayer modes. Turf War is back. Ranked Modes, after grinding 10 levels in Turf War, which is still fucking stupid. Splat Zones is back. Tower Control is back. Rainmaker is back. But now there's two podiums. Clam Blitz is back. But now you only need 8 clams for football instead of 10. Ranked Battle is now called Anarchy Battle, where there's two queues. Anarchy Series, where you play solo and wage your points to rank up depending on your performance. And Anarchy Open, which is more like a quick play mode where you're able to team up with friends. It's great that there are two ranked rotations at a time, so if there's one mode you really don't feel like playing, for me it's Splat Zones, you always have at least one other option. At the end of each match, everyone receives medals based on how they contributed. Which it's not just kills, but also playing objective, maintaining map control and being a good teammate, which is a great system. In Anarchy series, you can lose a match, but if you still played really well, you'd rank up. Every competitive game should have a system like this, especially team-based ones. I feel like a similar system was probably in Splatoon 2, it just was not visible to the player. Splatoon is all about its weapon roster, each one is like its own playable character. For my friends who watch my videos but don't play Splatoon, by the way, thanks guys, it means a lot. In some other shooting games, you get to select your loadout, you know, you get to pick Sticky Bombs or the Booble Shield. I assume I haven't played those games in years. But in Splatoon, it ain't like that. You don't get to pick. Every weapon has a fixed main weapon, sub weapon, and special weapon known as your kit. And then they add in a different version with the same main weapon, but a different sub and special. At launch, exactly one version of every main weapon from Splatoon 2 was available in Splatoon 3, which I think was a good move. Splatoon 2 had a problem where we'd have to wait several months for weapons from the first game, like the Range Blaster and Hydra Splatling to return at all. I mean, I wasn't that upset about it, I hate fighting those weapons. So it's good that returning players have a main weapon they like. That being said, all the sub and special pairings got shuffled around, and my favorite one, the tri Saucer, was given Toxic Mist, a sub weapon that does not work half the time, an Inkjet, which in the right hands can be game changing, but in my hands I activate it and then I, um, get sniped immediately. Thank you Rachel Ski. But while 48 of the weapons are repeats, there's four brand new weapons in two categories. The Stringer, a bow and arrow type weapon, and the Spatana, which is like a sword type weapon. Since the Tri Slosher was not happening for me, and I wanted a fresh experience, I switched over to the Tri Stringer, which also has Toxic Mist. Alright, yay. There was one new sub weapon, the Line Marker, sorry, Angle Shooter, that doesn't go where you're aiming because of the discrepancy between the camera and the inkling. And the 13 other sub weapons were the same ones from Splatoon 2. 
There's 10 brand new specials, or functionally brand new when it comes to the ones referencing Splatoon 1, and 5 returning from Splatoon 2. The stages, 5 brand new maps, 4 maps from Splatoon 2 that are basically identical, and 3 brought over from Splatoon 1. But of those 3, 2 of them are so heavily modified that they're basically brand new maps. There's a new mini game, Card Battle. It's Turf War but Yu-Gi-Oh! And only against CPUs at launch, but later in an update you can play it online against other humans. I've barely played it, but I'm sure it's fine. Salmon Run, the PvE mode. This is the mode I play the most. Like the rest of the game, it's improved in little ways. The egg throw makes the mode more dynamic. A few new night waves and boss salmon to fight, a new Grizzco stringer, there's a new King Salmon Kohozuna that you can fight every five or so rounds, and based on how much damage you do and how fast you kill it, they give you scales you can exchange for long-term rewards like locker decorations and new color suits. It gives you incentive to play, but also incentive to stop after a King Salmon. There's two brand new Salmon maps and spawning grounds from Splatoon 2 that should have stayed in Splatoon 2. Such a fucking terrible map. Salmon Run gives you money in chunks faster, versus Battle gives you catalog, level, and weapon stars. I'm not sure why using a weapon in Salmon Run doesn't count for weapon stars, but alright. Salmon Run is overall even better than before, but still treated as a side attraction, even though there are many, many players who mostly or exclusively play Salmon. Not including the amiibo only gear, Splatoon 3 launched with roughly 61 hats, 91 shirts, and 57 shoes to collect. I don't know the exact numbers, but it looks like about half of it was from previous games and the other half brand new, which is cool. Splatoon 3 at launch was also surprisingly buggy, which given how similar it is to Splatoon 2 and on the same console as Splatoon 2, you wouldn't think that there would be a glitch that would make your gun not shoot in a gun shooting game all about gun shooting. There are also mid-season patches for weapon balance adjustments, plus bug fixes, a whole lot of bug fixes. Overall, the weapon balance adjustments were generally well received. While it will always suck for your favorite weapon to receive a nerf, maybe it was your favorite weapon because it was a little bit too good, you know? If anything, people would mostly criticize lower tier weapons not receiving enough buffs, not that anything got nerfed too much. One minor nitpick that I have is sometimes a sub or special gets nerfed because it's too good on one overpowered weapon, but then every weapon with that sub feels that nerf. For example, did Fizzy Bombs need to get nerfed for every weapon, or just Sashi Machine? Despite the similarities and same console, Splatoon 3 was an instant sales success and sold just so many goddamn copies at launch. It was the fastest selling game in Japan ever. It's like a second Pokemania over there. For me personally, my goal in the first season was to reach S plus using exclusively the Tri-Stringer for a video I never ended up making. I managed to do it against all odds the day before the season ended, which was great timing since now everyone ranks down at the start of the next season. Which I guess makes sense to rank down inactive players. I swear for those rank up battles, the grimiest players would come out of the woodwork and get assigned to your team. The game was a lot of fun at launch, but it was still a lot of the same content from Splatoon 2 that we've had for over five years. So by the time the first season was ending, you've bought everything in the shops, bought all the good weapons, the excitement and allure of the new game was wearing off. So we were all looking forward to see just how much was going to be added in each season. And it turns out, Season 2 chill season. Not that much, but they did have a whole trailer for it, so that was exciting. 10 new weapon variations got added. Almost half were in the shooter class, but the rest were more spread out across the other options. I really like how the main weapon variants have different colors now. They didn't just slap on a sticker and clock out early like they did for the previous two games. There were also three brand new weapons, the Splattershot Nova, the Big Swig Roller, and the Snipe Rider 5H. Okay look, every weapon has a niche, any player can be affected with any weapon with enough time and practice, blah blah blah. These weapons were total dog shit when they first came out. Finally, new weapons, and they were complete ass. To be fair, these three were gradually buffed over the next couple of seasons, and now, nine months later, they're actually pretty good. But at initial release, a shooter that sucks at shooting, a roller that can't roll, and a sniper that can't snipe? I think they wanted to avoid a ballpoint splatling situation where in Splatoon 2, they would add brand new weapons, and they'd just be way too good and need to be heavily nerfed immediately. But um, wow, they may have overcompensated a little bit there. Two additional stages, a brand new map, Brinewater Springs, and a moderately modified Flounder Heights from Splatoon 1. Had it been Mido, personally, you know what I'm saying? 
considering it was Splatoon 3, Splatoon 3, Splatoon 3, each season I would have done one map from Splatoon 1, one map from Splatoon 2, and one brand new map for Splatoon 3. But that's just me though. X Battle was added this season where if you ranked S+, plus, the highest rank in the game, you can play for X Power instead in a third ranked rotation. To reach X rank back in Splatoon 2, you need to reach S+, plus, then rank up 10 more times. But keep in mind, in that game you can jump up several levels in only a few matches. I remember going from like S plus 2 to S plus 9 based on my performance. But in Splatoon 3 X Battle, they lowered the barrier of entries, so now you only need to reach S plus 0. And to be honest, I barely played X Battle, I'm sorry guys. I've reached the point in my life where I do not want to grind out Splatoon rank. Especially not in solo battles, and especially not for literally zero reward other than my name appearing in the app, I don't give a shit. And I hope some of my younger viewers are balancing playing Splatoon and other video games along with doing well at school or work, learning new life skills, socializing with peers, making healthy decisions, etc. Try to be a well-rounded person, you know? Don't only play the game. In Splatoon 2, I could win pretty consistently in X battles, but my skills and reaction time have diminished over the years because of aging, and it'll happen to you! So right now, I'm in a weird in-between state where I'm too good for S rank, but not always good enough for S plus or X battle. So I keep accidentally reaching S plus, and then rank myself down on purpose so I don't have to sweat as much. But when I did play X Battle, um, one of my teammates skipped the first Rainmaker checkpoint and, and just kept going. This is the highest level of play, some of the best players in the world. It's weird that X Battle is a separate mode from Anarchy and not just replacing Anarchy series at S plus rank. Dividing the already small percentage of highest ranked players across three different modes, not to mention Salmon Run, Turf War, Private Battles for scrims against other teams, even Card Battle. I've heard cases of players having trouble finding X Battle matches at all. And with Splatoon's uh, questionable matchmaking, players just went off and made their own matchmaking. Also, Anarchy Open is unplayable without a dedicated league battle mode, which they initially said would be in the game, and then they decided, nope, just kidding, Open is league battle now. In Anarchy Open, if you're not teaming up with friends, you get steamrolled by people who did. Anarchy Series is the only way to play a somewhat balanced match by yourself. There's one additional Salmon Run stage, Marooner's Bay from Splatoon 2, that's not that bad but maybe should have also stayed in Splatoon 2. And this season they added Big Run. Big Run happens one weekend per season, where the Salmon are invading, oh no! All it means is you play Salmon Run on a versus map instead of a Salmon Run map, every weapon is in rotation including a Grizzco weapon, and depending on your highest egg delivered score compared to the rest of the world, you get a different colored locker decoration. You also get double scales after every King Salmon fight, which is great, and maybe what the drop rate should be all the time. The problem with Big Run. On one hand, the rewards for being in a higher percentage being a different color locker decoration aren't all that exciting. You should give out a shirt that says, I survived Big Run, that would be exciting. Wait, I could make that shirt, nobody steal my idea! On the other hand, if you're giving players a rating, then players should feel that the effort they put in is directly correlated to the result they receive also known as a video game. But after a certain skill threshold, your results in Big Run feel more luck-based than skill-based. Normally in salmon weapon rotations, there's some balance between slower long-range weapons and faster short-range weapons. But in Big Run, every weapon in the game is in rotation and your loadout is entirely random. The problem with this is that half the weapons in Splatoon suck ass at Salmon Run. I don't care how good you are, nobody wants two GooTubers for a wave. The bosses you fight are completely random, the waves you get are completely random. It's way easier to get a high egg total on like high tide or a fog wave. You need all these different factors to align not once, but three times to get a score you're satisfied with. You could get an amazing wave one or two, but then in wave three you get four shitty weapons or 17 five fish in opposite corners of the map and throw it all away. It might be better if it was scored like the SAT, or at least how it was scored when I was in school, I don't know if they changed it. College board is pure evil. If you take the test multiple times, they take your best math score and your best reading score, not necessarily from the same day. So maybe Big Run should take your best wave 1 and your best wave 2 and your best wave 3 to help mitigate some of the randomness while still keeping the mode competitive. 
and maybe guarantee that at least one player will always have a Grisco weapon every wave to account for weapon RNG? I feel like that makes sense given that the Salmon are attacking. Bust out the big guns, hello? Had it been me though, you know what I'm saying? I would have a big run near the end of a season on a map not in the game yet as a sneak peek for the new map in the next season. You fight off the Salmon, then you get to use the new map. That's just Muto, that's what I would have done. 16 new clothes and 59 returning clothes were added in chill season. This update was okay. For me personally, I was focused on 5 star in the tri stringer for a video I never ended up making and then I haven't touched it since. Before all the launch players and the Christmas wave of new players have the game, you probably don't want to overwhelm new players with a ton of stuff as soon as they turn the game on, you know? But now that the bulk of players who wanted the game have the game, now is the chance to really wow us with season. Season 3, Fresh Season. Well this time there wasn't even a trailer, just a poster. That is a red flag. Where Chill Season added 13 weapons, Fresh Season added 11. 12 if you count Scope Charger separately, which I do not. None of them brand new weapons, just variations of existing weapons, and once again, half of them are shooters. It's been three seasons and there has not been a single new Brella, nor new Stringer, nor new Splatana. I finally got the Trisasha Nouveau, which is a Trisasha that I can actually use. But rather than give it a cool new pattern like the Soda Slosher pattern since it had the Soda Sub and the Soda Special, all it did was change the color of the handle. So this feels targeted. But there there were two new specials added, Super Chump, which is um uh, pretty fucking useless, and Kraken Royale, which is a modified Kraken from Splatoon 1. They're only on a few weapons each though, it's strange that Splatoon 3 has more subs and specials than any other previous game, but then barely gives the player any weapons with which to use them. I wonder if that will change in future seasons. The two stages added were a brand new map, Umami Ruins, and Manta Maria from Splatoon 2, which is largely unchanged, just a little bit wider hallways. There there was no new Salmon Run stage, but there was a new boss Salmon rotation called the Ouroboros, who I think is way more fun to fight than the big boy. Boris feels more like a video game boss rather than a raw damage sponge, and it's great that there's more variety in the boss Salmon now. The problem with boss Salmon. It was already part of my award winning Salmon Run video, so I'll make it quick. You see something you want, gotta get the scales. How do you get the scales? By fighting boss Salmon. How do you fight the boss Salmon? By filling up the stink meter. How do you fill up the stink meter? By everyone playing five more rounds of Salmon Run. How long does that take? Like half an hour, 45 minutes? Wait a minute, we won? Why did I only get bronze scales? Have you been hurt on the job by a big scrapper? Is your insurance only paying out bronze scales? Then you may be entitled to compensation. Law firm Captain and Captain can help. Call 1-800-WHAT-THE-FUCK-IS-THIS-STUPID-ASS-BULLSHIT. The silver and gold scale drop rates are like predatory gambling booby gotcha game low. I've played Salmon Run consistently for over a year, over 1700 shifts played, including every big run, defeated over 130 King Salmon, fought and lost against even more, and I've gotten a total of 34 golden scales. In a year! It cost 30 golden scales to get a jacket that was free in Splatoon 2! Having long term rewards is fine, but there needs to be better short term rewards in between those. If the total is stupidly high, it makes me not want to go for it at all. The easiest fix would be a scales exchange where you can trade a number of bronze scales for silver for gold and vice versa instead of what is here which is you play salmon run for an hour and only get all bronze and it's complete waste of your goddamn time the other new salmon edition was extra work also known as groundhog day the movie the game instead of three waves you play five waves and all the boss salmon spawns are completely fixed so you know who's coming where and you play it over and over memorizing the waves and the spawns and get a higher and higher score it's fun Fine for an hour or two, especially because some of the waves can be pretty challenging, but as you can imagine, it quickly gets very repetitive, especially with wave 1 being extremely boring. But apparently you're supposed to paint the entire map during wave 1 instead, I don't know that. It's another one weekend per season event. In the first one you couldn't team up with random people for whatever reason, but now you can. And what do you get for getting a high score? Say it with me, a different colored locker decoration. It's not bad, but this feels like a hastily cobbled together mode, made in response to complaints about big run randomness, but that's just a guess. Splatfests, I'll talk about these now, they're even worse! Again, already made a video about it. The positive, having three teams instead of two helps mitigate the risk of one team having a lot of mirror matches that don't count for anything. But not 
really when no one wants to pick Fry's team because she always gets the worst option every time? Strawberry ice cream, get the fuck out of here. Splatfests are now always two days long, only turf war competitions. So that's now two days where the game removes features and you can't play any of the ranked modes. The modes that many, many players prefer over paint the floor for three minutes. We in the design business refer to this as, um, uh, what's the word? Um, fucking stupid. A big flaw with turf war is that it's a fixed three minutes, but really only the last minute truly matters. East Splatoon 2 Splatfest always featured a brand new one day only stage, and many of them would incorporate mechanics to make the whole three minutes of turf war more important. Splatoon 3 um, got rid of that great idea and instead replaced them with tricolor battles that are 4v2v2 battles on the second day of Splatfest where two teams of two attack the one team of four in the middle. Initially, the team in first place after day one would be on the defending side and the two losing teams would be attacking. But after a couple Splatfests, they realized, no, that's stupid. So now any team can be attacking or defending, which is way better. Given this change, I'm still not sure why tricolor battles aren't available both days of Splatfest considering it's yet another limited time mode. Tricolor battles are much more fun and engaging than the standard turf war. They'd be even more fun if people would realize that if they're on one attacking team, they should not be attacking the other attacking team. We're on the same team, dumbass! Fighting the defending team to get to the Mega Sprinkler helps make Turf Wars more engaging for the full amount of time. The downside to Tricolor is that they're not on unique maps, just on slightly modified versions of existing ones. Except for the Zelda Splatfest that was a triangle. Remember how they had this cool art holding Zelda themed Splatoon weapons? Why not add these to the game? It would have been such an easy layup. Even as just weapon skins. The Trident Dynamo, the Tri-Stringer of Wisdom, the Master Wiper, okay maybe don't call it that. Oh yeah, around this time there was also a paid DLC trailer for Splatoon 3. Wave 1 was a paid plaza skin. You can make your plaza look like Splatoon 1 plaza. Except for Squid Sisters during Splatfest, there's no additional functionality. It just looks different. Cool for players who did not play Splatoon 1, but I did play Splatoon 1, so I did not buy this. Wave 2 had a teaser for side order DLC, which all three seconds they showed looks pretty interesting. Okay, so fresh season after like the first week was kind of a letdown. Get used to this feeling. Although, they did add 25 pieces of new gear and 126 pieces of old gear from the previous games. Holy crap, Lois! But we can only go up from here, right? Season 4. Sizzle season. Nope, it gets worse. But they did bring back the trailers, which is good. But this update was not sizzling. It's the smallest one yet. Including the scoped charger, where fresh season had 12 weapons, sizzle season has 11. Nine variations of existing weapons, and hey, they're not all shooters anymore, because every shooter except for the 52 gal and squeezer already has their second kit. Something else worth noting is Nova Shot and Big Swig received their second kits now, even though they were only added two seasons ago, even though weapons in the game since launch haven't received a second kit yet. At this point, a year into the game, they hadn't added a new stringer at all. I don't see the vision here. However, this time, there are two brand new weapons, a new brush, the pain brush, ironically the only brush in the game that won't give you carpal tunnel. It's like the dynamo roller, but for brushes. And the S-Blast 92, a blaster that looks like the Super Scope from the Super Nintendo, just like the N-Zap was the NES Zapper. The only one missing is the Wii Zapper. They should make it a stringer to reference Link's crossbow training. The S-Blast can shoot close and far, depending on if you're jumping. A weapon that could potentially surpass all blasters. So of course they gave it Sprinkler? And Reef Slider? They clearly had no idea how strong this weapon was going to be, so they gave it Dookie and Pookie. Man, some of these kit decisions just make zero sense to me. Like, Sprinkler's not bad, but Sprinkler? On all of these weapons? One returning map, Humpback Pump Track, pretty much copied from Splatoon 2. I barely played the map in this game, but if there are changes, they're minor, I did not notice them. And one brand new map. Barnacle and Dime. The problem with Splatoon 3 maps, they're kinda ass. Every time I've said, a brand new map got added, it's been a bad map. Procharo's video goes much more in depth on the mechanics of it, but from my perspective, it boils down to a lack of variety and a lack of options. The terms hallway and Tetris block get thrown around a lot because many of the maps have the same boring, flat, linear layouts. They added a new mechanic in this game to launch yourself up inkable walls and then proceeded to not add 
again, any inkable walls. They brought back my favorite map from Splatoon 1, Flounder Heights, an already pretty small map, and they shrank it down even smaller and just butchered it. They removed the heights from Flounder Heights. I, I don't see the vision here. Look at some of the older games. Camp Triggerfish is split in half. Moray Towers is a big zigzaggy map with lots of elevation. Piranha Pit had conveyor belts. And Joby Games had elevated platforms. Did these maps work in every single mode? Absolutely not. But these varied layouts and exclusive mechanics made the maps all feel unique from each other. Meanwhile, in Splatoon 3... And these new maps don't have very many approach options or flank options either. Older maps, you can go left, right, up, down, over, around. New maps, you just go straight. Every match feels the same, like you're just trying to one inch punch your way through every choke point. Even some of the returning maps from Splatoon 1 are suffering from this. They bring back an old map, a fan favorite, but it sucks here. The Fisher priceification of these maps is something to be studied. The silly thing is, in some of the earliest trailers for this game, we can get glimpses of better versions of the new maps in the game. I have no idea why they changed it. My complete guess is that during development, they had playtesters and focus groups come in who have never played Splatoon before. Maybe on the younger side, I don't know and they tried the more interesting versions of the maps, but they felt like the, the maps were just too complicated. So the devs had to rework and simplify all the maps very fast, and that's why the game probably got delayed, and even undelayed Xenoblade 3. Or maybe it was because Nintendo loves Turf War. They love wasting everybody's time by making us watch Turf War in tournaments, and these simpler layouts with wide open spaces are better suited for Turf War, at the expense of all other modes. And Aesthetically, the maps don't feel that unique either. I know complaining about map textures is the ultimate nitpick, but hear me out here. The new maps don't do a great job of feeling like you're at that location. Older maps, look at Mako Mart. It's indoors, it's got that Sam's Club looking ceiling, they got cereal boxes along the walls. It feels like you're in a mart. Camp Triggerfish, wooden textures, totem poles, netting for the grates, surrounded by water. Feels like I'm at camp. Black Belly Skate Park, ramps and half pipes, like a skate park. Gobi Arena, right in the middle, you got basketball, feels like I'm at basketball. It ain't gotta be complicated, but look at these new maps. Barnacle and Dime apparently takes place in a mall. Around the border, you can kinda tell, but not really from any details of the map itself. The floors and walls is just stuff. Mincemeat Metalworks takes place in a scrapyard, but I can't really tell other than the floating car they added on some of the modes. It's a similar shortcoming I have with some of the newer Smash Brothers stages where it doesn't always feel like you're fighting at the location but on a platform in front of it. Do they need to change a lot of the maps? Absolutely yes. Will they? Uh, I mean, they've reworked maps before. Splatoon 1 had some map revisions, Splatoon 2 had some map revisions, and Splatoon 3? Well, it's been over a year and they added a pole to Wahoo World. Did you guys know that this is a timer? Surprisingly, these simpler layers Layouts work well for Salmon Run. The newer Salmon Run maps are way more popular than the older ones. Sizzle Season added one new Salmon Run map, Jam and Salmon Junction, which is a bunch of straight lines, which works great for coordinating egg delivery. Challenges were added this season. They're like Special Smash. I always wanted a silly mode in this game, where they add a gimmick to a ranked mode, like everyone can jump way higher, or everyone has Buka Trizukas. They're quick little diversions, but they're pretty fun is what I would like to be saying if I could play them. They're only available at three times of random weekdays for two hour time blocks. Check out this one. The three options for my time zone are 10 p.m. to midnight. That's kind of late. 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. I'm not waking up at the crack of dawn to play Splatoon or 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. while I'm headed home from work. So I guess I just won't play this one. Why not make it available for the whole day? Is the game worried about there not being enough active players to fill lobbies of Across all the ranks? This game sold over 10 million copies in a couple months! What do you get for playing? If you win 5 challenge matches, you get a free gotcha pull.
As much as I like the new Salmon Run stage, in Season 4, I really stopped playing Splatoon 3, especially with Tears of the Kingdom coming out. But then I had to grind out 50 catalog levels in August before the stuff expired. The problem with the catalog. I ain't talked about it yet. It's my most hated feature of this game. It's basically a battle pass where you play, level up to level 100, and unlock exclusive in-game items like victory poses and fancy gear. It's supposed to incentivize you to play a little bit each day, with one win per day basically giving you a free level, but the rest takes quite a bit of time. A few players max out the catalog within the first week, and I'm sorry pro players, but you are never gonna beat the unemployed allegations. But the problem with the battle pass isn't unlocking stuff, it's the fact that at the end of the season, it goes away, and you miss that stuff and can only unlock it way later from the fucking gotcha balls. For example, if you don't max out the catalog in season 2, or if you just didn't have the fucking game yet, then you can't get any of that stuff you missed during season 3, then in season 4, you have a random chance of getting stuff you missed one at a fucking time from the fucking gotcha balls. To maybe sort of rectify this stupid ass mechanic, when they unveiled the season 5 catalog, players were uh, quick to notice that the catalog had 7 new items, 8 reskins of stuff already in the game, and 23 items from catalog 1. Ooh, people were so mad about this, proposing all sorts of better ideas, but none of them were asking the right question. Why is the catalog limited time in the first place? I know the reason. Why can't I just choose which catalog to pursue if I haven't finished the old one yet? Why hamper my ability to get stuff in the game when I paid for the fucking game? The reason is because Splatoon is an online game. It can control all of the content it needs to function except for the players. If there are not enough players, the game cannot happen and you do not want to be labeled a dead game, so they need to do whatever they can to coerce players to fill their lobbies and play the game. And a limited time battle pass creates FOMO to get players in the game. Why else do you think private battles don't give you anything for playing? Only online battles in public lobbies do, because you don't need Splatoon. Splatoon needs you. Anyways, yeah, worst update yet. It added 20 pieces of new gear, all of it only available in the catalog catalog, and 5 pieces of returning gear. But Splatoon 3's 1 year anniversary is at the beginning of the next season. Surely they'll add a ton of stuff this time to celebrate, right? Season 5, Drizzle Season 2. But what do you think happened? Where Sizzle Season added 11 weapons, Drizzle Season 2 added 10. Are you noticing the trend yet? Finally, 12 months later, one new stringer, and it's a tri-stringer variant with Sprinkler and Super Chump, this feels targeted. Two brand new weapons, the Heavy Edit Splatling, which is somewhere between the Mini and Heavy Splatling, so Medium Splatling? Also, I have no idea why they would call it the Heavy Edit Splatling when there's already a Heavy Splatling. Why not call it, I don't know, Corrector or Examiner Splatling like it's called in all other languages, or literally anything else that's not similar to something already in the game? Who is translating this game? Do they play the game? And also a new bucket, the Dread Ringer, actually a good name. You know how the Slosher's one slosh and the Tri Slosher's a triple slosh? Well, the Dread Ringer is two sloshes, the Duo Slosher. It's a very strange weapon, but I may try to learn it. Two brand new maps, Crab Leg Crapital and Ship Shake Cargo, and oh my god, they're actually pretty okay maps. With different routes to take, elevations, the settings feeling more like the settings to an extent. I do not think they're as amazing as people say, I think everyone so used to eating dog shit, that flavorless oatmeal is gonna taste incredible by comparison. What did they do for the anniversary? A big run with the new Grizzco dualies, and a Splatfest which nobody actually read the question for so they picked their favorite one, Shiver, even though Fry literally leads a team of eels in the single player and you know what, this whole experience made me 10% more racist. One Salmon Run map from Splatoon 2, Salmon Run Smokeyard, and you can get extremely ugly Salmon Run suits and each one takes several months to unlock, more stuff added to the salmon shop that takes several weeks to unlock, no new boss salmon which is what I was hoping for, season 1, season 3, season 5, it would make sense, and you can turn some hats around backwards 
swords, you can wear big shirt, 16 pieces of new gear, only available through the catalog, and zero returning gear other than those six Salmon Run rewards. And that's it. Each season has introduced less and less stuff. This season ends at the end of November, one year and three months into the game. There are currently 21 weapons that do not have their second kit yet, and 16 of them were in the game at launch! After this much time after their respective launches, Splatoon 2 was beginning to get third kits with the Ketsa collection, Splatoon 1 already had a lot of third kits with Sheldon's picks, there are enough sub and special weapon combinations to add 4, 5, 6 different kits for every main weapon, but unless there are some extra seasons at the end, or the updates suddenly ramp up in quantity, we're not getting third kits at all. In Splatoon, Three, which will effectively be less content than Splatoon 2 on the same console. The weapon categories were introduced at really lopsided rates. I'm so confused and mystified by the empty squares on the right side of this diagram. I don't see the vision here. Adding new kits is not as easy as going. But at the same time, it kind of is! Obviously they take testing so nothing is ridiculously overpowered, but some of these options are just baffling. But they've added so much. Yeah, but when I say they add like 10 new kits, the average player ain't gonna use all of them. They're gonna use like 2 or 3 maybe. Splatoon 2, Dooley's brand new. Splat Dooley's, Dapple Dooley's, Dooley's Squelch's, Glue Glue Dooley's, Tetra Dooley's, all within 6 months. Brella's brand new. Splat Brella, Tenabrella, Undercover Brella, all within Within six months. Splatoon 3, Splatana brand new, no new Splatanas 15 months later. Splatoon 3, Stringers brand new, no new Stringers 15 months later. Shit, I'll give you ideas for free. Duo Stringer, shoots two shots, faster charge speed. Quad Stringer, shoots four shots, slower charge speed. Long Stringer, tri Stringer but has E meter range. Wapper 06, it shoots lasers. Are these ideas good? No, but they're better than nothing, which is what the game has! NOTHING! Final thoughts. When Splatoon 3 was first announced, my reaction was, why? When Splatoon 3 first came out, my reaction was, ah, I see why. And now that Splatoon 3 has been out, my reaction is, that's it? Why? Splatoon 3 at its core is still a great game. I'd put it somewhere in the top 50 games available on the whole console, and there is a lot of good stuff here, like the music. Each season adds new songs, some songs are really good, others sound like a parody of Splatoon music, but where is the rest of the game? Why is this game not really making an effort to distinguish itself from its predecessor? Splatoon 3 is not beating the Splatoon 2.5 allegations. The few new modes are not even new modes, just reshuffling of existing game assets for an extremely limited time. Salmon Run, but on this map now. Clam Blitz, but you can only use a brush. Salmon Run, but it's five waves instead of three. Splatfest, but on a limited time map that's already in the game. And you can play each of these once every three months. From the consumer perspective, it's just really strange decisions. It never really felt like Splatoon 3 has truly hit its stride. It's a delicate tightrope walk between not overwhelming new players and having too high of a knowledge barrier of entry while still keeping veteran players satisfied. However, I think newer players would rather think, wow, there's so much stuff in this game, cool, instead of hearing longtime players complaining, like I'm doing right now. The sad truth is, Nintendo is not financially incentivized to add too much via free updates. They already got your money, as long as you're not alienated to buying a future Splatoon 4, they might as well save the best ideas for Splatoon 4! The good news is that there are plenty of other games to play. As we all know, Nintendo Switch has games. But that feeds into what I just said. Why keep adding stuff to this game, where instead they could incentivize you to buy other games? And the problem with online games is, we're all tourists. They said they're gonna support the game for two years, so it has to be a home run now for those two years because it ain't gonna last forever. It obviously won't immediately die as soon as the updates are done, but it will dwindle pretty quickly. Have you tried playing Splatoon 2 recently? Good luck finding a match! With no substantial single player and no bot players and no local split screen multiplayer mode, seriously why isn't Salmon 1 split screen 2? We won't be able to play this game in the future unless you know 7 other people with Nintendo Switches and copies of the game. And has it been a home run? Absolutely 
absolutely not. I would not call it a disappointment, but definitely an underwhelmingment. I would not go as far to call the game a cash grab, but it does feel more like a gap fill game. Splatoon 1 and 2 were far from perfect games, however they were consistently adding stuff and extra stuff and new features and bonus updates to earn the player's affection. Splatoon 3 feels more like they're just kinda coasting. A lot of the stuff here is great! But where's the rest of the game? This game is more neglected than a black family in Bush America! I remember back in 2016, there was a long drought of no Wii U games because the Switch was coming out next year and they wanted to have a strong first year. And I would not be surprised if by extension, they're already saving their best ideas for Splatoon 4 in the first year of the Nintendo Switch U that at time of writing is rumored to come out holiday 2024 right around when the Splatoon 3 seasons are scheduled to end. And fancy that. Now the ultimate uh, copium take, as the kids call it, is that they're gonna add way more stuff when Side Order comes out. Side Order looks really cool, but is single player and launches spring of next year. That means between March and June, there's gonna be one season after Side Order, maybe two. There are possible holiday Splatfest type events that Splatoon 2 had, but again, that's still stuff we've already had again. Hopefully, this video ages poorly, and in the last three seasons, they ramp up the updates, provide all sorts of stuff, maybe they'll do a final bonus season. But we must remember is that I'm someone who's never been wrong about anything ever. I always said they should have done a smaller scope Splatoon spin-off instead, like a, like a Tony Hawk or Jet Set Radio type skating game in the Splatoon universe, and save the next Splatoon for the next console where they can take all of these ideas and really hit a home run. Instead of putting out what ultimately feels like filler. So that's it. I've had it with Splatoon 3. I'm switching to Foam Stars. Community Corner. I asked on Elon Musk's 4chan 2 hell site what people liked and disliked about Splatoon 3. And I'm sorry guys, there were several hundred replies and this video is already so long and I'm already so far behind schedule that I don't have time to go through it all, but I'll link both threads in the description so you can check out for yourself what all sorts of players from different backgrounds and experience levels are saying. Both competitive and casual, veteran to first timer. And I've seen people upload similar sounding videos to this one while I was working on mine. I recommend you check out theirs and get more opinions. I purposely did not watch any of those yet because I did not want to accidentally steal any of their ideas ideas, but hopefully I'm uh, not way off the mark here. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, then you may also enjoy a previous video of mine about learning the Splattershot Nova, or some of my other Splatoon 3 videos that I'll link in the description. I'm obviously just one person with one opinion, so comment below with how you feel about Splatoon 3. Is it amazing? Is it underwhelming? Let me know. And today's comment code word is Hawkeye. Comment Hawkeye. You've made it all the way through the video, and uh, that's that's it, video's over.